season for joy. And as I started paying more attention, I began to realize, you know what, you hear this statement a lot at Christmas, don't you? Christmas is the season for joy. It seems like it's a bit of a package deal in our day and age. Joy and Christmas. And this kind of intrigues me, right? I mean, why would a culture who in general, I'm generalizing, has no interest or belief in God, consider a celebration about God reason for joy? Well, the short answer is they don't. But what they do think is that Christmas nonetheless remains an excellent opportunity for joy, just in other departments. A recent survey of Australians noted that the top three reasons that people uh, consider Christmas a season for joy or why they celebrate Christmas were these, top three, to spend quality time with friends and family, to enjoy the giving and receiving of presents, and because it's fun. Intimacy, materialism, and fun. And while none of these things are bad, like hook me up with some family time, a whole bunch of new stuff, and a lot of fun any day of the week, right? I'll take it. Something significant occurred to me as I was thinking about the answers on this list. And this is what it was. Everything on that list, like intimacy, like materialism, like fun, are not instruments of joy, but agents of happiness. And this morning I want to unpack the difference between joy and happiness because there is a difference and it's profound and it not only changes our response to Christmas, but it impacts our response to life itself. Is anyone here into photography? Give me a wave. I know you are, Pat. Give me a wave if you're into photography. Now, I'm not much of a photographer. Uh, I'm not much of a photographer. Um, but even as someone who knows very little about photography, I'm aware uh, about two pieces of equipment that photographers use, as I'm sure you are too. These are the flash, everyone say the flash. flash. And everyone on 30 will know this one, and the filter. The filter. Now, the flash is a pretty simple and common mechanism. It's more or less just a device, whether inbuilt or separate, that creates a temporary burst of light in order to help illuminate a scene. A filter is quite a bit more complex than a flash. And while less common in the profession of photography, Thanks to apps like Instagram and Snapchat has become almost a commodity for users of social media. Am I right? All you mute users of social media? Yeah, I'm right. A filter, at least on your phone, is a magical button that takes a drab and a dreary photo and it makes it look like this. I mean, look at the impact of that, right? And while the flash only offers a temporary burst of light to illuminate a scene, a filter permanently modifies a picture by, and here's the science of it, by amplifying or absorbing certain wavelengths or temperatures of light in order to affect the overall image. And now, the reason I'm giving you Photography 101 this morning on Christmas Day is because filters and flashes are a lot like happiness and joy. You see, happiness is defined in the dictionary as a state or condition of being happy. The state or feeling, or uh, the state of feeling pleasure or contentment. Happiness is sitting at a table on Christmas Day with a Christmas turkey, 
A glass full of wine, everyone's getting on, spirits are high, and you're actually enjoying time with your family, right? That's happiness. Happiness is unwrapping an unexpected gift and it actually being something that you like. <laughs> Happiness is escaping on holiday. It's getting away from the stress or the pressure or the pain of normal life. Having fun at the beach, going to the movies or reading a book in peace. Happiness is the state or condition of feeling happy, the state or condition of experiencing pleasure or contentment. But happiness, by definition, is fragile and temporary. You see, happiness, think about this, happiness is only happiness while there's a constant stream of things that bring pleasure or contentment. And so the moment that that difficult uncle or opinionated auntie makes an unhelpful comment about your Christmas turkey or the quality of wine that you're serving, or the moment that one of the cousins breaks your record player because despite being warned a thousand times, they didn't stop running and playing in the house, that's the moment that happiness quickly disappears, right? Laughing turns into arguing, and quality family time quickly becomes an episode of Survivor. <laughs> you know, I experienced this myself just a few weeks ago. Our regulars would know that recently I went on a family holiday to India. However, what most of our regulars don't know is that this trip started out as a 30th birthday present for my wife. The plan was that we would not take kids, that we would have these 10 glorious days without them. And because of this, because it was a present, I decided a long time in advance to start saving very, very, very hard. And I splashed out and bought business class tickets for Bianca and I. I know, right? What a great husband. That's what he was saying. Now, Things changed and we ended up bringing our children, but they sat in economy with my sister, praise Jesus. <laughs> but I never forget as, as I was sitting in business class, right, just nestled in, where I was positioned was at the very last row of the business class section. Right behind me, like literally right behind the wall that separated the last chair of business class and the first chair of economy was a crying baby. <laughs> <laughs> Who decided to cry nearly 12 and a half hours straight. And so it didn't matter that I had this lovely bed, I mean hello, bed in business class, that I was eating this chef-inspired food, the whole time I was not happy. All I could think about was this annoying baby, and I have two of them, I'm about to have a third. You'd think I'd have compassion. But no, my happiness was ruined because of this baby. You see, happiness is helpless. It's so fickle and dependent on everything going according to plan. And when it doesn't, we do either two things. We either double down and search for more happiness, or we medicate the absence of it. You see, happiness is like a camera flash. It projects a quick burst of light to help illuminate a scene, but only oh so temporarily and with only such limited effect. Joy, on the other hand, is very different. It's not dependent on external factors or stimuli. And it's not just a temporary flash of light or pleasure to illuminate your life. Joy is a worldview that you step into. 
It's a filter that you apply over the eyes of your heart, over the lens of your heart that has the capacity to permanently modify the scene or the image of your life. You know what the most profound thing about joy is? It can do this even in the absence of happiness. And so I want to, what I want to do the remainder of this morning is just quickly ask and answer three questions. Everyone say three questions. They are this. What is joy? How do we get it? And why do we need it? So what is joy? Well, as with many broad topics and subjects like joy, there's a plethora of definitions out there. But I want to share what I think is one of the richest and most robust I've found to date. With a small nuance for me, John Piper describes joy as a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of God both present and future in his word and in his world. I'll say that again. Joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of God both present and future in his word and in the world. Now, this definition, while somewhat more nuanced and wordier, is actually anchored out of the Bible's own definition. You see, the word for joy in the Bible is the word kara. Everyone say kara. And rather than meaning happiness or some synonym of such nature, kara actually means, catch this, the awareness of God's grace and beauty. Notice that unlike happiness, which is a state predicated on acquisition, joy is a state predicated on recognition. Where happiness is dependent on external factors and the constant inflow of positive stimuli, joy is self-sustaining. It's built purely on the recognition of God's unmerited grace and his matchless beauty. And this is why there are countless stories and occurrences in the Bible of godly men and women who embody a God-given gladness despite being faced with difficulty or hardship because they have joy. Because they chose to look upon or recognize God's grace and favor in the midst of unhappiness. Remember the story of Paul and Silas? They've just been, now catch this, I don't want you to gloss over this. They've just been stripped, right? Stripped naked, shamed in public, and beaten with rods like police batons, right? If that wasn't enough, the Bible says then they were severely flogged. And yet, several hours after this traumatic and painful ordeal, sitting in a maximum security jail, waiting for what was probably going to be the death sentence, here they are, not feeling sorry for themselves, not depressed or complaining that they're done with God or done with the church because everything didn't go the way that they hoped. No, they choose joy. They choose to recognize God's grace and beauty in the midst of very real heart, a very real pain and very real difficulty. And having chosen joy and probably kept choosing joy, Eventually their feelings catch up and before you know it, the Bible says that they were praying and singing songs of worship. And this is the answer to our second question. How do we get joy? Firstly, only in and through relationship with Jesus. Secondly, only as we stare into the beauty and the grace of God. 
We get joy by choosing to reorient our energy and our heart from fickle flashes of happiness, a well-manicured garden, a, a, a resume full of accomplishments and achievements, an insta-worthy holiday or house or haircut, and instead we choose to recognize the grace and the beauty of God. We get joy when we choose to recognize that Jesus died for us. That we were on a collision course with death and eternal isolation from God, but for His grace. We get joy when we recognize that God has great plans for us, plans to prosper us, plans to give us a good and a hope-filled future. We get joy when we remember that if He is for us, who can be against us? That God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son on Christmas so that anyone, anyone, who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, one of the things I've noticed about myself, and most of the Christians I come in contact with, is this. A decent number of Christians genuinely love Jesus, right? A smaller, but still solid portion of those Christians not only genuinely love Jesus, but are disciplined about making and forming habits to become like him. But very few Christians, myself included, live lives that are characterized by joy, that are marked by its presence and its power. And I can't help but think it's simply because we spend more time watching Netflix or staying up to date with the grandkids than we do staring into the beauty and grace of God. Amen. We confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, but then we spend most of our time and money, you think about this, We spend most of our time and money on chasing happiness. Think about what you've done with your time and money even just in the last week or two. And the small portion that's left over from this, well, we spend it on then medicating ourselves from the absence of happiness. You see, happiness has become the great coping mechanism of the 21st century. And yet, this is exactly the answer to our third question, why do you need joy? Because long-term happiness doesn't work. Because happiness fades, but joy saves. Say that again. Because happiness fades fades, but joy saves. I want to pull this apart for a second. I want us to wrestle with this following conundrum. You see, you and I live in a world that is more affluent and materially rich than at any time during the existence of this planet, right? Right? We have drastically more capacity and resource than any generation who's gone before us to create flashes of happiness, to curate a life full of every kind of pleasure and comfort you could ever imagine. And so if happiness worked, we'd be the generation to prove it, right? And yet... Every single psychologist or doctor, Christian or atheist, will tell you that despite our unprecedented capacity to create happiness, 
that we are instead the most depressed, anxious, stressed, medicated, unhappy generation to have ever walked the face of this earth. Did you know that children these days, not CEOs, not lawyers, not teachers, not farmers, I'm talking about children, right? Children these days whose only job it is is to have fun and learn stuff, right? Children these days experience drastically higher levels of anxiety and depression and catch this than psychiatric patients did nearly 50 years ago. You know, if all of this wasn't compelling enough to prove that the drug of happiness that we relentlessly pursue isn't working, isn't adequate to quench the deepest yearnings of our soul. Well, there was a recent global phenomenon that proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt, and that phenomenon was called COVID. Recent data from the World Health Organization conservatively estimates that the global rate of depression and anxiety has increased 25% since COVID. That's mind-boggling. It had increased by like 3% over 20 years prior to that. And over 18 months, all it took was 18 months of losing the constant inflow of pleasure and happiness and the collective mental health of our planet began to spiral out of control. And what's fascinating is more often than not, it was you and I, the rich Westerners on a global scale, that were affected the most. It was those who were most entrenched in the pursuit of happiness. Those on the highest dosages of this drug called happiness. That when our ability to make ourselves happy took a hit, we found ourselves lost. And you contrast this with the endless stories of men and women in the Bible the persecuted Christians in the first century, even recent stories of Christians in China and other parts of the world who are beaten, who are urinated on, who are tortured day in, day out, and yet they write about the gladness that they have in their heart because of Jesus. You consider the survivors of the Nazi concentration camps, most of whom held fast to the hope they had in God. You consider and look at the atrocities of African-American slavery and listen to the kinds of things that they had to endure. And then you hear the songs like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot or go down Moses, or steal away Jesus, that were birthed during this oppression. And all of a sudden you can't argue that they had something. They had a filter in their life that provided refuge from or protected them in amongst pain and brokenness. And that filter, my friends, is called joy. Recognizing the grace and the beauty of God. You know, one of the most misinterpreted scriptures in the entire Bible is found in a book called Nehemiah. Everyone say Nehemiah. Chapter 8, verse 10. Israel, the country, or God's chosen people, is facing hardship and pain on every side. And Nehemiah says to them this nugget of wisdom in verse 10. It says this, Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know the word for strength used here is the word morose. Morose. 
However, what's fascinating is that in the, I don't know, 57 something times that this word appears in the Bible, not once is it translated as strength. It's translated what it means. Refuge, fortress, protection. You see, I think translators got to this verse and thought, gee, I don't know, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I I think we'll just go with strength instead. However, this does make a lot of sense, especially in light of happiness and hardship. You see, I think God is telling us that the antidote to pain That the antidote to brokenness is not happiness, is not pleasure stacking or medicating. That there is a refuge, there is protection in the midst of pain and suffering. It won't take it away. It won't mask it or hide it or, you know, make it disappear. But there is a refuge, there is protection and it's called joy. It's called camping out on the truth and the promises for both now and the future to come. And so this morning I agree, Christmas is the season for joy. But joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness fades, but joy saves. What I want to encourage you before you leave before you sink your teeth into that delicious Christmas food and beverages. I want you to just be in this moment for a second and to ask yourself, to think about your own life. If you feel lost this morning, if you feel bombarded by stress, by pain, by the anxiety of life, if you know that, yeah, well, you're up today, History tells you that sure enough, the day will come where you're not feeling so up. I want to tell you this morning that there's an antidote and his name is Jesus. Maybe you're here and you know Jesus. Maybe you're thankful for his birth, for his death and resurrection. My question for you this morning is this. Are you chasing happiness or are you chasing joy? Even on the very day that we say we have joy because of the birth of Jesus. Do we really? Are we building lives on the foundation of the pleasure of family time? Or the pleasure of holidays or new stuff or man's approval? Or are we building our lives on the foundation of staring into the beauty and grace of God? Can I encourage you this Christmas with these words of truth? Happiness fades, joy saves.